Coming up on this Thursday edition of Daybreak, Xi Jinping, the president of China, North Korea's only major ally, will hold summit talks in Seoul today with President Park and Hay. The leaders are expected to call on Pyongyang to end its pursuit of nuclear weapons. President Park strongly criticizes the Japanese government for its recent re-examination of a landmark apology for wartime sex slavery, saying it betrays the trust between Korea and Japan. Plus, the Korean won hits a six-year high against the US dollar. Analysts attribute the won's appreciation to upbeat economic data out of the US and China. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Thursday, July 3rd here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you are tuned in to Daybreak. And where else could we start but with Chinese President Xi Jinping's highly anticipated visit to Seoul on this Thursday for summit talks with Korean President Park Geun-hye. It'll be their fifth meeting in the space of just one year. But the two leaders still have plenty of things to discuss. As our Yulian reports. Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to Seoul this week sends a strong message to the North Korean leadership. It's practically the first time a Chinese leader, after taking office, is coming to South Korea before paying a visit to Beijing's traditional ally, North Korea. When the leaders of South Korea and China meet on Thursday, they will seek ways to substantially develop their strategic cooperative partnership with a strong focus on the North Korean nuclear issue. Pushing for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and maintaining peace and stability on the peninsula and solving issues on the peninsula through peaceful means have always been the Chinese government's established policy. While Beijing will likely oppose recognizing North Korea as a nuclear weapon state, it's uncertain whether the two leaders will highlight more than denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula in an expected joint statement following the summit. The South Korean presidential office says Presidents Park and Xi will also discuss reviving the six-nation denuclearization dialogue with Pyongyang. Also topping the agenda for the meeting of the two presidents will be the North's cozying up with Japan as of late, Tokyo's backtracking on a historical apology to Seoul, and Japan's attempts to expand its military presence. It's only natural the two leaders talk about Japan. They will discuss Japan's push to deny historical facts. Beijing, involved in a bitter territorial dispute with Tokyo, is expected to seek greater cooperation with Seoul on historical issues. On the economic front, the leaders of Korea and China will agree to speed up negotiations for their free trade agreement and appeal to businessmen from both sides at an investors' forum on Friday. Yurian, Arirang News. Now, without naming North Korea by name, China has called for more efforts to ease tensions on the Korean Peninsula. This after Pyongyang fired two projectiles into the East Sea on Wednesday. Since the firings came one day before Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to South Korea on this Thursday, there's speculation Pyongyang is expressing displeasure over his visit to the South with an absence of such a visit to North Korea. However, China's foreign ministry downplayed such a possibility on Wednesday, saying Beijing sees no connection between President Xi's visit and the firings. Beijing also dismissed similar claims earlier this week after the North fired two Scud-type missiles into the East Sea on Sunday. Now, when Chinese President Xi Jinping lands in Seoul, he will be accompanied by his wife, who is perhaps just as well known as her powerful husband. Our Song Jisun has more on China's first lady. She is the Michelle Obama of the world's second largest economy and has been referred to as the Carla Bruni of China for her past career in entertainment. It's Chinese first lady Peng Li Yuan, whose reputation within China is as large as that of her politician husband, Chinese President Xi Jinping. Unlike her predecessors, 
The former singer and performer has been outgoing and active in her role as China's first lady. The world's 57th most powerful woman, according to Forbes magazine, is also a goodwill ambassador for the World Health Organization. Selected to the international best dress by Vanity Fair magazine last year, everything Peng wears makes headlines in fashion magazines and immediately sells out. Peng is scheduled to visit palaces in the Korean capital and attend cultural events during her two-day visit and will be on her own for most of our itinerary while her husband holds talks. To show around the city, the presidential office of Chong Wade has tapped current senior secretary for political affairs Chu yun Sun, who will serve as Peng's personal tour guide during her stay. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. Now, in the rest of the day's news, the Japanese government is wasting little time starting the reinterpretation of its war-renouncing constitution. 24 hours after Japan's cabinet rubber-stamped a resolution on the matter, Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary Katsunobu Kato said a team led by high-ranking officials from the defense and foreign ministries had already been assembled. The 30-member council is set to come up with revisions to the constitution that give Japan greater military freedom. The Japanese daily Yomi Yomi Uri Shimbun says the goal is to have the revisions passed at a regular parliamentary session next May. The Japanese cabinet adopted a resolution on Tuesday that ends a decades-long ban on collective self-defense. This will allow Japan to come to the aid of a friendly nation under attack. President Park Geun-hye has slammed the Japanese government's review of its landmark apology for wartime sex slavery. Speaking to China's CCTV ahead of President Xi Jinping's state visit to Seoul, the Korean leader accused Tokyo of diminishing the 1993 Kono Statement, in which Japan apologized for forcing tens of thousands of women into sexual slavery. Saying such an act had only further hurt the victims and broken trust between the countries, President Park said Japan's past system of sexual slavery is a universal human rights violation that remains unresolved to this day. In response, Japan's foreign ministry said it regretted President Park's re remarks as its re-examination was not intended to damage the credibility of the apology. Now, nearly three months have passed since the Sewolho ferry disaster, but there are still more questions than answers about what exact exactly happened in the run-up to that day and on the day itself. Parliamentary hearings are underway to uncover some of those answers. And on Wednesday, the head of the Korea Coast Guard was in the hot seat. Our Jim Young gil reports. The special parliamentary committee investigating this Hilda ferry accident simply could not understand why not a single person was saved from the sinking Hilda ferry. When the rescue teams arrived, why didn't they go into the vessel's steering room? Did they know that people were trapped inside? We weren't able to get into the ship because there were too many obstacles in the way. Lawmakers also questioned why the Korea Coast Guard told emergency responders to hold off from starting rescue operations when they arrived at the accident site before the Coast Guard. A rival party lawmaker grew angry when asking why the Coast Guard didn't contact passengers on the sinking ferry. If the Korea Coast Guard has sent a text message or made a phone call to the passengers telling them to abandon ship, they would have. Why didn't the Coast Guard do that? During Wednesday's hearing, the committee determined that the Coast Guard was not in proper control of the situation in the initial stages of the accident, something that led to false reports early on, including that 370 people had been saved. Opposition lawmakers also voiced opposition to President Park Geun-hye's decision to dismantle the Korea Coast Guard. And while they agree with their plan to establish a new national safety ministry, they say it should be an independent body and not under the watch of the Prime Minister's office. Jim young Arirang News. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak.
The Korean won hit its highest level against the US dollar in close to six years on Wednesday. The won breached the 1,010 won level and closed at 1,009.21 against the greenback. Analysts attribute the won's appreciation to upbeat economic data out of the US and China, which drove stocks on Wall Street to all-time highs, giving investors the confidence to take some risks. Seoul-based Nonghyop Investment and Futures for One said the Korean won could further strengthen to the 1,000 won level. However, Goldman Sachs expects the strong won to go down to the 1,031 level in the second half of the year, betting on the slowdown of the Korean economy. Now, Korea and China will ink a deal on this Thursday to allow direct trading of their local currencies, a move expected to boost cross-border transactions. Korea's presidential office of Chongwade says that under the deal that will be signed during today's South Korea-China summit, traders from the two countries will no longer have to pay transaction costs when converting Korean won to Chinese yuan and vice versa, since there's no need to convert it to the US dollar. This will also help to reduce potential exchange rate risks. In addition to the direct trade deal, China is reportedly considering issuing investment quotas to Korean financial institutions, allowing them to invest directly in China's capital markets. Now, if there is one, the investment quota with Seoul is expected to be worth up to 13 billion US dollars. China has similar quota deals with Britain, Hong Kong and Taiwan. There are growing concerns, though, about the Korean economy, especially that it might fall into a low growth trap. And many experts are urging the government to boost public spending and overhaul some really rather old regulations to spur growth and reinvigorate domestic demand. Uh, Huang Jie has this report. Earlier hopes that the Korean economy might settle into a stable period of recovery were dashed by April's ferry disaster, which made a massive dent in domestic consumption. As a result, private institutions have slashed their growth forecasts. Now, a growing number of economists are asking that a new economic team to be led by the incoming finance minister use all the fiscal and monetary policies at its disposal to spur growth. They say the government should pump money into the economy to help it escape from a low growth trap, even though that could very well lead to a fiscal deficit. A cut to the key interest rate economists say could also be an option. The central bank's inflation target band is set at a rather high rate with the nation's inflationary pressure running low. If the pace of recovery continues to remain sluggish, the key rate should be run in a more flexible manner. Analysts also suggest the government improve its tax policies and cut excessive red tape to boost corporate investment and private spending. Some recent economic data has left some questioning whether Korea is truly in a recovery phase. The nation's output across all industries fell for the second straight month in May, while output in the manufacturing and mining sector dropped 2.7 percent last month from a month ago. That marked the biggest drop since December 2008 at the height of the global financial crisis. Hwang Ji, Arirang News. Now, nanotechnology has helped create many of the products we use in our everyday lives. So talking about things like display devices and even textiles that we wear. But that's just the beginning. A three-day event kicked off on Wednesday in Seoul that provides a glimpse at the potential of nanotechnology and as our Shin Se-min reports, the future is really rather bright. Invisible speakers, LED headlights on automobiles, and even T-shirts. All of these products were created using nanotechnology, which in the simplest terms is a manipulation of matter on the atomic scale. To give an idea of the size, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter and one ten thousandth the diameter of a strand of human hair. Under the slogan of nanotechnology, the engine of creative economy, 360 private companies and research institutions from more than a dozen countries are taking part in a three-day event in Seoul, some of them displaying products that will soon hit the market. 
from a see-through toaster and LED light bulbs to hiking shoes and waterproof phones, all using technology that people can see and feel. Over 50 objects are on display, all of them using nanotechnology. This year specifically, we try to show nanotech objects that incorporate the biology, environment and telecommunication sectors, objects that could also become industrialized. Nanotechnology, which has a range of applications in the development of automobiles, textiles and even in machineries, has become a new growth engine for South Korea. A recent report from the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy shows that the domestic nanotechnology sector created over 128 billion U.S. dollars in sales in 2012, up over 27 percent from the year before. And according to an industry insider, Korea has the potential to become a global leader in the industry. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Thursday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. Israel is urging restraint after a body discovered in Jerusalem was determined to be that of a Palestinian boy. He was 17-year-old Mohammed Abu Qader, last seen being forced into a car in the West Bank early Wednesday. His body discovered later that day in a Jerusalem forest a few miles away. The development is raising suspicions of a reprisal attack one day after Israelis buried three teenagers who they believe were kidnapped and killed by members of Hamas. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu condemned the death of the Palestinian teen as despicable murder and promised a thorough and swift investigation. Localized clashes were reported in East Jerusalem and the West Bank afterwards as angry Palestinians threw rocks at Israeli forces. Palestinian leaders said they held Israel responsible for the killing. In Iraq, strong evidence suggests Iran has sent fighter jets to help its neighbors stave off the fiery Sunni insurgency. This according to analysts at London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies, who said that a July 1st delivery originated from Tehran, based on an imagery analysis of the markings, serial numbers and camouflage of the Sukhoi Frogfoot ground attack jets. If true, this would also mean longtime enemies Iran and the U.S. are now working side by side in the conflict. U.S. drones and helicopters have been actively gathering intelligence on the Sunni insurgency led by the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. Disgraced former French President Nicolas Sarkozy said he was profoundly shocked after being put under formal investigation for alleged influence peddling. In an interview with French TV, Sarkozy denied breaking the law, insisting that the French justice system was being used for political ends to give him a reputation that is just not true. He became the first French president to be put under detention on Tuesday to be questioned on whether he had asked a sitting judge to disclose insider information on a 2007 probe on his campaign funds. And finally, at least nine civilians are feared dead in eastern Ukraine as the Ukrainian army is believed to have shelled and bombed the village of Luhanska. Rebel forces said the attack came from the ground and from the air in the early hours of Wednesday. Amateur video showed shelled buildings and bodies strewn on the streets. Kiev said their forces were not in that side of Luhansk. Fighting was relaunched after a 10-day ceasefire was left to expire on Monday.
And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off with Park Ji Sung, who retired from football earlier this year, came out in a recent video stating that he will make his final appearance on the pitch at the 2014 K League All Star Game. In the video, the former national team captain stated that he wanted to say goodbye to his fans and make his final appearance in front of his fans here in Korea. Now, he added that through this, he wants to see the league grow and hopes that more fans will come out to the K League matches. You want the 2014 K League All Star Game will take place at the Seoul World Cup Stadium on July 25th. And that's staying with football, but over to the ongoing talks on manager Hong Myung Bo's future. And despite earlier reports that the president of KFA Chung Mong Gyu will meet with manager Hong, looks like the decision will be instead made by the KFA themselves. Now, according to the Korea Football Association, they will make their final decision on the issue by today, 10 a.m., adding that the decision between him uh, fi being fired and looking for a new manager or allowing the managers to continue on with the national team until the 2015 Asian Cup. Now, though no one is certain which decision will be made, sources say that the KFA officials are leaning towards firing manager Hong Myung-bo after his one-draw, two-loss result in the Brazil World Cup. And now going into our 2014 Brazil World Cup coverage, no matches today and tomorrow after the 16 nations all finished up their matches. So let's now take a look at how the quarterfinals look. Of course, taking a look here, it looks like the quarterfinals will consist of four European nations and four South American teams as Germany and France will kick off the next round on July 4th. Brazil and Colombia matchup should be an interesting one as Argentina and Belgium will square off and the Netherlands will take on Costa Rica for the final quarterfinals match. And now finishing things off with some Wednesday night KBO action. We had two games rain out with the Tucson Bears and the Kia Tigers raining out early and the SK Wyverns and the NC Dinos raining out in the middle. But the Nexon Heroes win another one over the Lotte Giants 7-3. So let's now take a look at the highlights between the LG Twins and the Hanwha Eagles. Of course, going into the game, here we go over to the first inning of the game. Kim Kyung on singles to center. But an error by the center fielder scores Lee Young Gyu and Hanwha takes a 1-0 lead. Bottom of the inning, bases loaded for Lee Byung Gyu draws the walk and we're tied 1-1. Fourth inning, Kim Kyung Yi at bat and an RBI single to left and LG takes the lead 2-1. Sixth inning of the game, more from LG. This time, OG Hwan with a two-run double to center and it's now 4-1. Not done yet, Son Joo-in single to right, a two-run single and the LG Twins take the lead 6-1 as they hang on to win this game 6-2, your final score. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning, I'm Lee ji with your weather update. Well, it's drizzly right now here in Seoul, and as we can see on our radar map, other regions are still receiving heavy to moderate monsoon rainfall at the moment, and this monsoon rain will continue throughout the day today, which will drag down the highs a lot lower than yesterday. Highs will be hovering mid-20s, making just above 25 degrees Celsius across the region. So so with that said, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The morning low here in Seoul is starting out at 21. Then the high in the capital, Daegu and Gwangju will all rise to 26, while Busan should make it to 25 later in the afternoon. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It seems like down on Jeju and Daegu should see a high of 26, and Dokdo will reach 22, while Mount Kungang hikes up to 16. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Korea Today is coming up in about 30 minutes' time, and we'll be back at the same time on Friday. Until then, goodbye.